And today we have a fabulous presentation on doing programming for Earth Day. And Kira has definitely worked with me in trying to make this something that you all can use knowing that in the current environment, most of your libraries are closed. So um, just a little housekeeping, I will be sending out the recording and the slides after the webinar. And if you have any questions, you all are muted, so you will need to use chat. Um, if there's anything else, I am in the chat under the ND State Library, and I'm here to help with any tech issues. All right, Kira, take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I just want to take a moment to really reflect and be just so grateful for your time. I know that everything that's going on is definitely taking a big toll on some of our professional goals, but also, you know, just personally, the health of our families and and all of that is definitely on our minds. So I'm grateful for your time, happy to have you all here, and hopefully we can all together come up with some fun ideas for things that we can do in April, but also throughout the rest of the year as things hopefully return to normal very soon. Um, so my name is Kira Heeshan. I am the Education Coordinator here at Earth Day Network, and my job here really is to engage the public around the world with educational materials to help them learn about environmental issues that are relevant to their community, but also around the world and things that they can do um, to be engaged in science and to be engaged in civic action and, and really help them understand their role in the environmental movement. So just a couple things we're going to touch on today. Um, I just did my intro and next we're going to talk a little bit about the history of Earth Day. Um, I celebrated Earth Day, I think, pretty much every year growing up in schools and, and always had some little fun thing that we did in class, but so much of the history of it I did not know until I actually started working here. So we're going to go over some of that, and then I'm going to talk to you guys about um, our 2020 initiatives. This year is our 50th anniversary, so we have a lot of really big goals that have definitely not changed. We're still moving forward. Um, and then talk about our resources and opportunities for your libraries, and then some of our next steps. So I wanna first begin by setting the stage for what was happening prior to the first Earth Day. So the beginning of the 1900s, we, our, the United States saw a huge burst in industrialization. And a lot of those side effects like pollution and smog, um, were sometimes seen as a positive. Those, those were the signs of our economy growing. And so as time went on throughout the 1900s, there were these kind of key moments where our attitudes to the environment and our awareness of what we were doing to the environment started to shift. So the first I wanna mention is Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which came out in 1962. I think it's incredibly appropriate that, you know, one of the first key points in the environmental movement as I talked to a bunch of librarians, is a book. I think that's wonderful. Um, but so that book was the first really significant piece of literature that drew the public's attention towards the impact of the chemicals we were putting out in the environment. Um, she really focused on DDT and its impact on pollinators and our, our use of pesticides and all of that. So that was a huge uh, turning point in our awareness of the impacts of our, uh, what we were doing to the environment. And the next was this Earthrise photo. So that was from the first uh, mission to the moon. And this was a photo that was sent back to Earth and really just kind of changed the way people thought about the Earth. This was the first time we saw it as kind of this tiny little blue fragile speck in the universe. Um, so that was definitely formative as people started to realize, you know, maybe the Earth is a little bit more vulnerable than we initially thought. Um, and then in 1969, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio actually caught on fire because it was so polluted that it had become flammable. Um, also in 1969 was the Santa Barbara oil spill, um, which was again another huge environmental disaster that had people really waking up. And then socially and culturally in the United States around this time, we had the anti-war movement in Vietnam, and we also had the civil rights movement. So we had this kind of era of civic action as all of these environmental pieces were kind of coming together. So what happened next is Senator Gaylord Nelson from Wisconsin was looking at all of these pieces coming together and decided that he wanted to host a national teach-in for the environment. And so what he did is he created a bipartisan committee of senators who were going to 
host and plan this national day to talk about the environment, learn about it, and really decide that we were gonna take action to protect it. So he hired a team of students all over the country. And here on the screen, you see it, Dennis Hayes. He was the national coordinator back in 1970. Um, and he is also still on our, uh, on our board, leading a lot of the things that we're doing even today, which is great to have him. Um, so they really worked together you know, without social media, without the internet, and we're able to get 20 million Americans to go out into the streets and to demand that their government take care of both the health of the environment, but also human health. Because with all of the air pollution, water pollution going on, human health was at risk at the time. Um, and so this day really became this spark plug and bore out what we know as now the modern environmental movement. Um, the first Earth Day within that year of 1970, um, sparked the EPA being formed. Uh, it sparked the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act. So this one monumental day really sparked a lot of formative foundational environmental policies in the U.S. So 20 years later was the first year that Earth Day really became celebrated globally. Um, Dennis Hayes, again, you can see him on the screen, uh, 20 years later, but still as handsome, of course. Um, you know, we were able to still get 2,200 million people around the world to celebrate Earth Day. Um, the major focus back then was on recycling and on waste management, because that was a really critical issue um, that year. And of course, you know, it's interesting that we see that issue kind of coming back um, in importance. And so it's definitely something we're continuing to work on now still. Um, and then Earth Day today. So we have done some research on social media and, and some of the Earth Day mentions around the world. We've seen that Earth Day is celebrated or commemorated in 192 countries. That's more than 1 billion people taking part in some sort of Earth Day event, you know, tree plantings, cleanups. Um, this looks different in lots of different countries, and some it's more of a, a Mother Earth or a Gaia event. Um, but we work every year with um, thousands and thousands of partners who are working on the ground in their communities to educate and to mobilize people who want to protect the environment. And, and really enhance their communities. So as we started to plan for 2020, we wanted to think about, you know, what were the key pieces of what we wanted to address for this monumental 50th anniversary? And so we decided on these four kind of elements on the screen here, science, action, volunteerism, and education. So for science, we have developed a brand new citizen science initiative with the Wilson Center and the State Department. And this is an app where users can go in and collect data that is gonna help the global scientific community better understand our impact on the environment. And then as a user, you're able to then interact with that data and learn what you can do about it. So right now the app has a widget on air pollution and plastic pollution. And so you users can go out and take pictures and collect data on that. Um, but then as they're collecting this data, they might be confronted with this, you know, oh gosh, I'm finding lots of plastic pollution in my community. What are some things I can do about it? And then the app is gonna feed information about things that people can do both in their individual day-to-day -day life, those ind individual actions that um, are really important, but then also, you know, how can we create more structural change? How can we reduce the amount of pollution that's um, being introduced into the environment in the first place? So. That's a really awesome, exciting initiative. And then for action, that's kind of all of the Earth Day events that we've all kind of known to, or come to love and expect every year. Um, the concerts and the rallies and some of the uh, exciting uh, festivals that we have in our communities. Um, unfortunately, right now we're seeing a lot of those being canceled or postponed. Um, so it's definitely something that we wanna encourage communities to, you know, host throughout the rest of the year as well. Um, it doesn't have to be on Earth Day, it doesn't have to be in April. These events really help to sustain um, kind of the momentum of environmental awareness throughout the year. So whenever your community um, is ready to host an event, we're, we're definitely excited to have them. Um, then we also have the Great Global Cleanup. This is everybody's favorite Earth Day activity is to go out and to pick up litter and to really improve their communities. Um, but we've paired this initiative with Earth Challenge so that while people are going out and um, participating in these cleanups, they can collect data on the stuff that they're collecting and again, try to, try to work so that 
you know, people aren't coming back two, two weeks later and it looks like we were never there. We're really trying to halt kind of that, that litter flow. And then the big one I want to talk to you all today about is the global teach-in. So the teach-in really was that first model of Earth Day back in 1970. And so the global teach-in is really trying to get um, people around the world taking part in these educational opportunities and really bringing it into the 21st century. So this slide totally breaks all the rules of what a good slide looks like, and I'm so sorry for all the text. But because this uh, presentation is going to be sent out, I just wanted to give you all the links and all the resources you could possibly want. So this is just a quick snapshot of all of the other programs that we have. Um, we have a lot of programs that are on specific conservation issues like biodiversity and our food system and plastic pollution. But then we also have a lot of programs that interact with specific audiences. So talking to you all today because we're very excited to have libraries on board and to, to be able to use all of your community resources and expertise that you have. Um, but we also work with faith communities and um, university students and elected officials, athletes and artists. So this page is really meant just to be a resource in case you want to explore some of our other stuff. So I just want to go in a little bit more in depth to the teach-in. Um, we kind of got some feedback as, throughout our planning that some of the elements of that first teach-in weren't as popular anymore. Uh, when we said the phrase teach-in, a lot of people were like, well, what is that? I've never heard that term before. And so our first goal was to really provide a resource that says, you know, what is a teach-in? What are these historical roots? And then, you know, how do you host one? What does it look like? What elements do you need? So we created a teach-in toolkit for everybody to use this year and beyond. And I'm just gonna get out of this screen and show you a little bit of what it looks like. So our teaching toolkit is here on our website and the link is on the slide as well. And so we have all of these pieces of information that will be helpful to you as you work to plan one of these teach-ins. Um, and before I go too in depth, I just wanna also say that the teach-in is, is an incredibly adaptable model. Um, it's fantastic for a wide variety of age ranges. It can definitely be done for very young learners who just wanna have space to talk about some of the things that they're hearing on the news and that can be a little bit scary, but they wanna just have a space to talk about, you know, these impacts that we're having on our environment. And, and one of the key pieces of supporting youth in the environmental movement is providing them with really tangible actions that they can take to make them feel like they have um, an ability to make a difference in it. So that's the spiel on the age diversity um, for teach-ins. So we have all this information about what it is, steps to hosting one, um, and all of this, you know, you can adapt specifically to your community. Um, if you decide to host a virtual teach-in or an in-person teach-in, we definitely want you to register it with us so we can see what you're working on. Um, but then we also wanted to provide a resource for, you know, say you decide you want to host a teach-in and you want to have this educational event for your community, where do you start? You know, what topics are, are out there? And if you have a topic that you know you want to do, how do you learn more about it? Who should you invite? So we created these grab bags. So this is really just meant to be a springboard for all of your planning and to help guide you through the process. So say that your community is really struggling with biodiversity loss. You know, you know you have a native species that's really struggling, and so you want to address that with your community members. So you can go in and learn a little bit more about the issue, get a couple of resources from some of our, our partners and our um, really trusted uh, global resources, some objectives you can have for the event, and then some sample calls to actions. And so the really key part of a teach-in is that everybody who attends should walk away knowing a couple of actions that they can take to make a difference. So we have a couple of suggestions for individual actions, things that people can do in their day-to-day -day life, but also things they can do community-wide or on an advocacy level of things that they can do to make a difference um, and to kind of influence change with their leaders. And then we also have a couple of ideas for different speakers that you can invite and uh, other content professionals that could really enhance your event. So this is the, the toolkit. I definitely encourage everybody to go through. Um, 
we have lots of topics and actually we're still adding some. <laughs> so definitely a lot of great information there. Let's go back in. All right, and then we also have been working on a series of menus. So we have menus for all sorts of audiences. We have them for zoos and aquariums and student clubs and um, parks and nature centers and all that. And we have created one also for libraries. So we really wanted to make sure that um, you all feel supported in both having the content you need to create these kinds of events and to do really anything for Earth Day, but also that you you have a resource for you know ideas of a, a diverse array of things that you could be doing uh, to celebrate Earth Day, but also to be doing environmental content throughout the year. So I'm going to jump out of here again just to show you this document. Um, and so what we've done is we've broken all of our programs out and just kind of done you know four to six quick ideas of programs that you could host or things that you could do at your library. Um, to engage in these, in these programs. So of course we have the teach-in and all of the different topics you can engage with. Um, we have Earth Challenge, so if you have things like computers or tablets to lend to your community, you could do a data collection day, or even if you don't have that technology, you know, you can host events where you talk about those issues, utilize some of the lesson plans we've created around it, um, and get people engaged. And then of course we have artists for the earth. I think art is such an incredible tool for libraries um, where community members can come in and, you know, it, as simple as, as drawing or making paper crafts um, or even, you know, recycled material sculpture making. Um, it's really, we see art as this tool where community members and, and even professional artists can use any medium to both communicate the science behind some of these environmental issues, but also to communicate emotion behind it. So, you know, what are some of our fears and our concerns about the future, but also most powerfully, what are some of our hopes? What do we want our future to look like, you know, when we, when we envision what sustainability and, you know, a green community could be. So this is a great resource if you're just, you know, thinking about what you want to do this year and any year in the future um, for environmental activities. And this is just a great springboard to, to get you thinking. Um, we're absolutely welcome of you guys to reach out to us anytime and, and ask for more ideas and, and support from us and just also keep us up to date with what you're working on. We're always very excited about that. Let's pop back in. And so, of course, now we're kind of confronted with how does all of this shift to digital? How do we adapt as we're all kind of stuck at home or some of our, our libraries are closed? and um, the events that we've been working hard on are now canceled. So this part, we've, we've been working on coming up with some ideas for you all, but I also would love if people, as you've been listening to this, if you've had any ideas kind of pop in your head and you want to share that in the chat, I'm really curious to hear kind of what resources you have and what ideas and tools that you could use um, in order to engage with your audiences for Earth Day in a virtual space. Um, also, you know, what ideas you have to postpone or to engage later on in the year. Um, so a couple of quick ideas we've talked about is to host online read-alouds. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, just have a sip of water. So to host online read-alouds, there's an incredible array of green books um, for younger learners and definitely um, fascinating and incredible uh, environmental books for older learners and, and adults as well. So hosting a read aloud um, via some online meeting technology or even a book club, gathering people to discuss something that they've read, even to discuss some of the news that's coming out about the environment or even, you know, popular news about what's going on with coronavirus, just giving people a space to gather in a community when they can't necessarily do so physically. Um, also on your websites, you could highlight some of these green books and some of these more environmental reads um, throughout the month of April, on Earth Day, whatever your comfort level is there. Um, we've heard of some li libraries opening up some of their digital rentals, um, so their online copies of books, being able to provide those to community members, any magazines that you have digitally or journal articles. 
Um, we would love to see uh, virtual teach-ins being hosted. So if you have um, the time and the capacity to host an online event, um, we would love to see you guys reaching out to, you know, a local nature center, a local conservation department. Um, I actually have a lot of colleagues and friends that work for either a state conservation department or uh, some sort of environmental nonprofit. And a lot of them are closed and their programs are being canceled and they're kind of looking for ways to engage with the public. So if you wanted to be the host of an event like this and kind of bring them into the fold and have them offer their expertise, I think it, this is definitely a ripe time for that. Um, there's also definitely opportunity for um, people to share videos of them doing, you know, recycled art projects or, or environmental poetry or songwriting. You know, there's a lot of great ways to engage with art as well. Um, so some of the resources we see being kind of needed in this time is um, online meeting technology. You know, we're using Zoom right now and Zoom is fantastic. Um, so I definitely recommend that. Um, but Earth Day is also working on compiling a list of online technology that could be helpful during this time. And so it's not published yet, but we're definitely working on it. Um, and so we're working to have this great list of resources that you can all utilize um, during the remote work that we're all doing. Um, resources to you also include your local nonprofits and conservation departments, like I mentioned. Um, they're definitely a great resource and they're looking for things to do in ways that they can support both you and your community members. Um, we are also working on compiling a huge library of resources of education materials that both we are, uh, we are working on presenting, but also that our partners have been working on. Um, there's also just an amazing abundance of live streams online of wild animals and animals in zoos and aquariums. I know the Cincinnati Zoo is having a wonderful daily kind of species teach-in on some of their animals in their, uh, in their zoo. Um, I think they did Fiona the hippo yesterday. She's quite the celebrity. If you haven't heard of Fiona, I definitely recommend looking her up. Um, but yeah, so those live streams is a great way, you know, if we feel stuck inside that we can kind of engage with nature, um, both that we're familiar with that is in our backyards, but also nature that's available globally that we might not ever get to see in person. So that's very exciting. Um, we are also kind of in this mid phase of adapting ourselves to what we're working on. So I would definitely encourage you all to visit earthday.org in the next, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, and just kind of see what more resources are coming out and how we are working to transition to a digital Earth Day. Um, we're definitely working on more resources as well. So this is a, a phrase that is suddenly <laughs> much more pertinent, um, but we do like to say that Earth Day is not just a day, it is a movement. The things that we are able to accomplish on April 22nd are incredible, but it's really what happens afterwards and, and the momentum and the commitments that are made um, throughout the rest of the year that make people um, better stewards, that make people want to advocate for the environment, um, both in their community and globally. So I would love to see some stuff in the chat about what you all want to accomplish together in 2020, especially as we're kind of facing some of these other difficulties. And just hear some of your ideas and, and excitements and love to get chatting. Um, but before we do that, some of the ways that you can join our movement is you can sign up as an Earth Day partner. Um, our partnership is really just so we can put your, your logo on our website and kind of show this incredible collective impact that we're all working towards for the environment. Um, you can definitely connect with organizations in your area and combine forces to have really impactful programming. Um, you can register any of your events on our website and that both um, helps you kind of recruit more people in attendance because people um, often come to our website looking for things to do. And so if your event is up on our map, it helps uh, bring more people in. Um, but it also just helps us, again, demonstrate that collective work that's being done. And then some of our resources that we have available is our Teach-In Toolkit and the grab bags that we've created, our Earth Challenge app and some of the lesson plans that we have, all of the menus that we have created, and then our Education Resource Library and our Educator News Network newsletter are both great um, sources of information if you're really looking to dig into some education materials and ideas of how we can support 
you know, public libraries, university libraries, school libraries, um, all of those. And then definitely keep your eye on our map. It is shifting right now to better represent what's happening digitally. But I think throughout the year as, as um, in-person events kind of pick back up, we're gonna see a lot more um, of those in-person events that you can attend as well. So that is all I have for you. Um, definitely happy to take any questions. And then if you um, are watching this later and want to ask any questions, feel free to email me at fusion at earthday.org and I would love to chat with you. Yeah, and I think one, one other thing I'd love to say is that um, we're looking to edit a lot of our menus to better represent digital options. So if as you're looking um, at the, uh, the menu for libraries, if you have any feedback or if you have any ideas based on, you know, you guys are all the experts on what resources your library has and what works for your communities, um, you know, you know way better than I do. So if you have any ideas or feedback on, on what could be in that menu um, as we suggest more digital options. I would love to hear from you. Ooh, I'm reading that Diane said that she has an Earth Day event around sea turtle conservancy and pollution. That sounds fantastic. That's definitely a big issue. I think um, with our, our plastic pollution program, the, and I don't know if you all have seen it, but there's a, a really tragic video of someone pulling a plastic straw out of a turtle's nose for, on a boat. So hard to watch, but that video did more <laughs> for the environmental movement than I think so many other videos have because people were so crushed by it. And it just, it, it really, you know, kicked a lot of people into gear um, to really start addressing their personal plastic use. So I, I love that you're doing one on sea turtles. That's really fantastic. So there is a question and I'll, uh, I will reference this for everyone rather than just responding. Um, I know that many of you are telecommuting and the question is, is there a document for your supervisor and that you attended this webinar? I don't, we don't generally um, do certificates for continuing education purposes, but if you need it to show like, hey, yeah, I did do this webinar for, you know, half hour, 45 minutes, um, to give to your supervisor, send me an email at ndsltrain at nd.gov and I will get something out to you. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I'll just um, reiterate that you can definitely follow us on social media and stay in touch with what we're working on. We're definitely trying to compile resources of online webinars and free live streams and, and tons of things that parents can do at home that we'd be happy to share out with you. Um, my team working on the education has spent so much time focusing on, um, you know, how do we support teachers that are working on environmental education in the classroom? And we are doing a huge shift to how do we support parents that are now at home with their children, expected to work from home, now also expected to teach their children and also maintain all of their other responsibilities. So, um, yeah, so we're definitely trying to work to provide resources for those parents and just ways that, you know, we can entertain their kids for a little bit. Um, so you all as libraries are such already a trusted resource to them. So any materials that you find you're happy to share with us and we can also share all of our stuff with you and hopefully then you can disseminate um, to those, those parents who, who really need our support right now, definitely. Um, there is one comment from Annalise about um, environmental and recyclable material crafts. Um, and I think it's, she's just saying that she loves the idea. And it's a great way to involve multiple age groups in an activity. Libraries throw away a lot of things and I'd love to hear any ideas you have about things to make. Um, an idea she had is using their shredded paper to make sculptures like paper chains or such uh, with kids. Yeah. I think environmental crafts and recyclable crafts is one of my favorite things because you're you're taking things out of the waste stream, you're using it to really bring attention to the fact that it was in the waste stream to begin with, but it's also just so fun and engaging and you, all, you tend to have really fun uh, products afterwards. Um, so some of the things I've seen that I think are really impactful are using plastics to create um, marine uh, life. So you can 
find plastics and then build, you know, a sea turtle out of it or create a, an ocean wave out of some of the plastics that we find. Um, I think it's a really interesting kind of juxtaposition of creating this beautiful art piece, but then also making it out of something that's really harming the environment. It's really interesting. Um, another really fun one that I've seen with paper products is actually creating seed infused paper. Um, so you can definitely Google how to do that, but basically you have some of the, the recycled paper that you have used up and you can put um, flower seeds on top of the paper and then layer another piece of paper and kind of meld it together into a new piece of paper that has, uh, that has seeds inside of it. And so you can plant them, give them as gifts, make birthday cards out of them. Um, it's definitely a more sustainable way to, to do some celebrations like that. Um, in terms of art, I also have seen um, people focus a little bit more on the written art in terms of environment. So I've seen a couple posts about people watching some of these live cams or even going out into their backyard and watching, you know, a lot of birds are returning from migration right now. And so having kids sit down and really reflect on, on the journey that they might have just taken and writing a poem about it or doing a creative writing piece of things that they, you know, maybe that bird saw on its way back from from South America or something. So tons of awesome art activities to do. Um, and it's definitely a great way to engage diverse ages. Um, I would definitely encourage you to kind of Google away at all of the awesome things that you can do with recycled art as well. And then just a final comment uh, from Jennifer. And she's just saying uh, she'd like to set up a survey via their Facebook and website, what areas their population is most interested in investigating. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think some communities have environmental issues that are really obvious. Um, you know, some communities experience flooding on the regular now. And so an event on flooding resilience or, or sea level rise could be really obvious. But I think sometimes it's a little bit harder to know what our community is facing. And so reaching out to those community members and saying like, what's interesting to you? What, what are you struggling with in the environment? What ways do you want to improve on your own environmental footprint and see what they're interested in? And definitely getting that, that community buy-in to your event planning is a great idea. Well, all right, um, we kind of have hit the half hour mark. So if you all have any questions for Kira, her email address is here on the screen. It will be included in the slides that I send out. Thank you so much, Kira, for coming and doing this presentation, um, even when we're all, we were all kind of unsure what was gonna happen. <laughs> thank you so much for having me and thank you to everyone for, for coming and listening. I'm, I'm happy to kind of, you know, virtually meet you all. <laughs> all right, thank you.